So I can't remember what movie we were watching recently, but it's a familiar scene. There's a traveler who's going through the desert and they're all alone on this long journey and they're tired. They're exhausted. They're out of water and they're thirsty. And they look up ahead and they see what they believe to be a pool of water. And even though though they're so tired, they begin to run towards that pool of water. But as they get closer, they realize there's no water there. It's only a mirage. A mirage is an optical phenomenon. It, It has to do with light refracting to produce a displaced image. A mirage is an illusion. It's not real. We live in a world that talks a lot about peace. And yet I believe most of it is just a mirage. It is an illusion. People give the peace sign to one another all the time. People say, all I want for Christmas is peace on earth. Many are searching for inner peace. And I hate to be a Scrooge this morning and burst people's bubble, but I believe a lot of this is just an illusion of peace. It's not real peace. Because the world's idea of peace is more about comfort, the absence of difficulty, and more about self-interest, self-focused. And God's definition of peace is something so much more, so much greater. That's where we're going to head this morning with this message. We're going to begin again in Isaiah 9. We've been here the last couple of weeks to start with. We've seen the foretelling of the first coming of Jesus Christ. That a light has dawned in the darkness. That hope is arriving. That greater joy is coming. Oppression and war will eventually end. And then we get to verse 6 in Isaiah 9. We understand who will bring about this hope, this joy, this peace. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. I I love stories with a twist. Something unexpected happens that you're not expecting to happen. Uh, So example, uh, you all know we're Star Wars fans in our family. I I talk about it enough. So we faithfully watched The Mandalorian, the new Star Wars saga. A couple episodes ago, they introduced a character that everybody, everybody had thought had died in the original movies. It was a shocker for me. And I I love that, a twist in the story. And I recognize we're so familiar with the Christmas story that we don't appreciate what a twist it was. What a surprise God was revealing to the world in Isaiah 9. A child. Through the birth of a child, God would bring forth his redemptive plan. We know now, but they didn't know back then the child would be God's son. Jesus Christ will be given by the Father to save the world from our greatest threat, the sin that's broken our relationship with God. A child to be born. And this child would be like no other child the world has ever seen. Let's go back to verse six. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There's such a depth and richness to each of these words. We don't have time this morning. I'm sorry to unpack all of this. But I want to say a brief word about each one. Wonderful Counselor. So many suggest that these two words are two distinct ideas. So Wonderful and Counselor should be seen separately. So wonderful. This child would bring amazement, admiration, and wonder, and even do miraculous things. Counselor has the idea of one of great wisdom. He would bring knowledge, 
and teaching and counsel that this, this, this world would need. Mighty God, a strong and powerful deliverer who would be like a hero, who would have a divine nature, everlasting father. The literal rending is father of eternity. And this connects to the kingdom of the Messiah. He would be a father forever to those in his kingdom. And finally, prince of peace. And this is where we're going to focus in on this morning. This child would be the prince of peace. For the Hebrews, peace was so important. The Hebrew word for peace is, come on, people. Shalom. Shalom. You've been around a Jewish person. You've heard the word shalom. Shalom means peace completeness, soundness, wholeness. Shalom is a state of well-being that affects every part of a person, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And it's very much relational. Shalom flows out of our right relationships with God, others, and ourselves. And shalom carried with it this idea of permanence. It wasn't meant to come and go. It's meant to last and remain. So I was really struggling to think of an illustration for Shalom. So this might be a bit of a stretch, but I thought of when our children were born. That's, that's a baby on Google Images. That's not one of our <laughs> kids. It does actually look a lot like Joshua, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to you, Josh. <laughs> so I remember that day very well. And I acknowledge I did very little that day. It was all Yvonne. I was a bystander. I was a cheerleader somewhat. And I was a supporter, right? I, support. <laughs> I just want to clarify that. But one of the things I'll never forget is when they brought our newborn child into the nursery and the nurse did the APGAR test on our children. And the APGAR test, it tests the, the muscle function, the heart, counts the fingers and toes. I'll never forget Jenna because she was wailing and crying during the APGAR test. And the nurse is like, her lungs are absolutely fine. No worry <laughs> here. The APGAR test is a test to make sure the child is sound, well, and whole. The child has arrived as they should be. And this gets to the heart of shalom and peace. That things are well. Things are as they should be. So we're going to go next to the Christmas story in Luke 2. And see how peace shows up in Luke 2. So Luke 2, verses 10 through 14. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God. In the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So peace on earth is a common expression we use, especially at Christmas time. Everybody wishes for there to be peace on earth. It's a sentimental feeling we all share. So the angelic host in verse 14, they praise God and say glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace. I think a lot of people take verse 14 as this idea of global peace, peace on earth. And I really had to dig into this verse this week. I think it's important we closely look at the next phrase. So bear with me. Stick with me a few moments here. There's a word here in the original language that gets translated in two different ways. In the King James, this word is translated goodwill toward. Goodwill toward. And this is the nominative case for this word. 
William, are you proud of me right now? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the entire phrase in the King James is on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So this translation is alluding to God's good pleasure, favor, and peace for all people. Again, this is a nice sentiment, but I don't think this is the meaning of the verse. I think the NIV's rendering of this word makes a lot more sense in the context and the whole of Scripture. The NIV uses the genitive case of this word. That case would lead the word to mean of goodwill, of good pleasure, of favor. So the whole phrase in the NIV is on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Mm -hmm. Do you see the difference? It qualifies who is receiving the peace. Mm -hmm. Peace on earth for people whom God is pleased with, whom God's favor will rest. I'm seeing the thumbs up from William, so I'm feeling better about myself. <laughs> this is speaking about those who will be in a right relationship with God. Peace will come through Christ to those who know Christ. This is a significant difference. So I think it's important we understand the context of Jesus' birth. So at the time of Christ's arrival, Rome was experiencing a time of peace, stability, freedom from wars. This lasted about 200 years, 27 BC to 100 AD. And it became known as Pax Ramona, Roman peace. And there was this guy, Epi Epictetus, and make sure I get that right. He was a Greek Stoic philosopher during the first century. He was not a Christian, but I believe he nailed it right on the head when he wrote, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart, which man yearns more than even for outward peace. He's saying Roman peace is a mirage. What people really long for is peace of heart. When Christ came, there was not instant global peace. Christ came to bring peace of heart. This peace is available through the reconciliation that is offered through Christ. It's reconciliation. That's what Colossians 1, 19 through 20 teaches us. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. And through Christ to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Our greatest need for peace is our relationship with God. And that relationship was broken through our sin, through our rebellion, through our telling God, God, we don't need you. We can do this life on our own. Christ came to bring reconciliation between us and God. And church, this is the good news of the Christmas story. A savior has come. And peace with God is now possible. And that peace comes through a right relationship, a reconciled relationship with God through the blood of Christ. And that is the source of peace that I believe the angels were foreshadowing here. So this is not about universal peace in our world. It's all about the peace that's found in Christ alone. And the hard truth is those outside of Christ will not experience this peace. Outside of reconciliation with Christ, there is no shalom. So I thought of a scavenger hunt. If you've ever been on a scavenger hunt, you have this list of activities that you need to do and items you need to find, and you go item by item, checking off the different things. You're trying to come to that last thing to win the prize, to get the treasure. I think a lot of times we are scavenging for peace in this life. We're trying all these different things with hope that they'll bring peace to us. In our quest to chase down or hunt for peace in this world, we're going to come up empty handed. It won't be found in the things 
of this world. That's what Jesus tells us from his own words. The availability from, of peace from Christ is nothing like the peace the world can offer us. Jesus would say in John 14 to his disciples, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I'm going to read that again. I think we need to hear this. I think we need to receive these words from Jesus to us. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This is Jesus' promise to those of us who are his followers. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. The Prince of Peace gives us his peace. Not a form of peace. His peace. And his peace is not what the world is offering us. One of the greatest treasures we can find in this life is the peace that Jesus Christ gives us. And it's not a mirage, not an illusion. It's a real gift given by the Prince of Peace. And maybe you're thinking about where you're at in your life right now. And is it, can it really be true for me to experience the peace of Jesus Christ right now? Can I really have peace in the midst of a pandemic? Can I really have peace in my financial struggles? Can I really have peace in my singleness? Can I really find peace in my busyness? Can I find peace in my loneliness? Can I have peace in my grief and the loss of my loved ones? Can I have peace in my broken dreams and disappointments? Can I really have peace with all my health issues? And the answer to all of those questions is absolutely yes. Absolutely, yes. If you're in a reconciled relationship with God, the peace of Christ has been given to you. And I've talked to you, some of, this, some of you this year, who have gone through tremendous challenges, very dark moments, life and death moments where you didn't know if you had another day to live. And you told me from your own words, the tremendous peace you experienced, even in the darkest moments. Church, that is the Prince of Peace at work in our lives. And maybe you're thinking, I'm not really feeling peace these days. And I'm struggling with that myself. I'm not feeling peace all the time. And we have to understand that peace goes beyond what we are feeling. Too often we allow the happenings of life to really do a number on our emotions our understanding what peace is. I find Brennan Manning's words very helpful. Circumstances can play havoc with our emotions. The day can be stormy or fair, and our feelings will fluctuate accordingly. But if we are in Christ Jesus, we are in peace. And there, unflustered, even when we feel no peace. Even when we feel no peace, if we are in Christ, we have peace. Let's not let our feelings dictate what is true. The promise from Jesus is, is peace has been given to us, whether we feel it or not all the time. And we need to learn to receive his peace. So how, how do we do this? How do we receive the peace of Jesus Christ? I want to encourage us with a couple next steps. I love this quote from Anne um, Voskamp. <clears throat> peace isn't a place. Peace is a person. So in the pace of the season, make space for Emmanuel to find peace in the soul. If you want to experience peace, make space for your relationship with Christ. Slow down. Take time. Listen. Pray. 
Invest in your relationship with God. There are many good things in this season. But let's not miss out on carving out the unhurried time and space for our first priority. Because when we spend time connecting with Christ, we have the opportunity to receive from him the gift of peace that he wants to give us. I think sometimes we got to mix it up a little bit. So for me, I usually wake up in the morning. I start the coffee. That's kind of number one. <laughs> uh, don't judge me for that, okay? <laughs> uh, I start the coffee. I pour myself a cup of coffee. I go to the dining table with my Bible in my journal. It's my normal routine. I start my day with God, Bible open, journal open, spend time in the word and prayer. And it becomes very routine for me. And I've told you guys, I'm good at checking off boxes. It's not hard for me to do. And I just sense God saying, you know, mix it up a little bit. And I'm not doing anything drastic. Instead of sitting at the dining table, I'm sitting at a chair by the Christmas tree in the morning. And I turn the lights on. And I just, I don't rush through that time. It's not checking off boxes anymore. It's just sitting in that chair, spending time with God in his word in prayer. And I'm just trying to listen more. I'm trying to reflect more. I'm trying to slow down and think about the season and all that it means for me and all the peace and the hope and the joy that's available because of Christ. So I'm going to encourage you, maybe you need to mix it up this week. Do something different to spend time with God. What would it look like to make space and time for Christ to receive his peace in your life? Second, the peace of Christ isn't just for us to keep to ourselves. It's meant to ripple out and for us to bring peace into our relationships and into our world. We're called to be peacemakers. James 3.18 says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. You think about a gardener. They take this tiny little seed and they sow it into the ground. That gardener knows not to be fooled by the tiny, tininess of the seed. That seed has the potential to grow. And the gardener sows seed after seed and then waits and watches is ready for the harvest. God has called us to sow peace. Every time you sow peace in your relationships, it matters. It might not seem like a big deal at the time, but wait and watch. Let those seeds grow into a harvest of righteousness. I do believe God wants to bring peace into our world. But it's not going to come through the government, politics, the economy, better health care. Peace on earth will come through people who are reconciled to God through Christ first. And then those people go out and become peacemakers. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. For those of us who have the peace of Christ, we go out. We sow seeds of peace in our relationships. We bring the shalom that God has given us in Christ. We sow peace in the lives of those who do not know Christ yet. And we wait for God. We wait for God to bring the harvest of righteousness for people to experience reconciliation with Christ. Are you a sower of peace? I think in all the differing opinions right now with the virus and mass and soon to be the vaccine, the divisiveness in discord is not going to go away. It will continue. I believe it's our responsibility as Christ followers to not lose sight of the main thing in this world right now. Yes, people need peace right now. But more than that, they need to know the Prince of Peace. They are ultimately not going to find peace from a vaccine, a better job, better health. Peace will only come through Jesus. In this Advent season, I want to charge us to be peacemakers for ourselves, to get to know the Prince of Peace more, to slow down. 
enter into his rest, spend time unhurried with God and receive the peace that Jesus wants to give you. And then go out into your families, into your friendships, into your workplace and sow seeds of peace. Tell others about the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. God, we just want to first acknowledge there's a lot of mirages of peace in our world. There are a lot of things that promise to give us peace that will not deliver. And I pray for us, God, I pray that we would be able to see through the illusion and remember that we can only find peace from you. And God, I thank you that you want to give us your peace. And Jesus' promise to his followers is that he leaves his peace. He has given us his peace. And so I pray, God, that we would not settle for anything less than the peace that you want to give us. And I think, you know, some of us are carrying things that are so heavy right now. And I pray in those heavy places, God, that you would bring your peace. That peace that passes all understanding. That peace that will guard our minds and our hearts right now. And God, help us to slow down in this season, to get to know you better, to remember that you are the Prince of Peace, and that in our relationship with you, you want to minister your peace to us, God. And God, I pray that we would not hold back on being sowers of peace in this world that we would step up and be courageous and strong and empowered by your spirit to bring peace during this divisive time, that we would be bridge builders to people who are far from you, God. And through our lives, through the hope and the joy and the peace of Christ in us, God, they would see you, God. We would shine for you. And it would be undeniable. There's something different about us. It's because we know the Prince of Peace. And I pray, God, you would give us opportunities to share Christ with others in this season. So more and more in our world would be reconciled to you. They would truly know the Prince of Peace. So, God, we recognize we need your help. Because left on our own, we can't do this. In our own strength, our own power. We need your help. We need your spirit to empower us, God. So come and meet us where we're at. And lead us forward. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.